self-custody can be mainstream. Custodians have been holding our money, our stocks, our bonds for us for centuries. But what has changed with Bitcoin is just that Bitcoin is now digital money relative to any other point in history. It's very easy for people to self-custody in a secure way. It can be a systemic risk to Bitcoin to have most of it sitting with custodians just because it's very identifiable where it is at that point. That change in technology is really powerful and really has the potential to change the banking model because now banks have to think about what are all the services that I provide around this custody model instead of just how do I aggregate assets in order to lend them out. When you give people more responsibility, they improve the quality of how they act thanks to cryptography and private keys. Why aren't people taking more self-custody? I, I always bring that example of I have like a few friends of mine who are almost all in in Bitcoin and they still don't have self-custody. They still have it completely on exchange. Um, why do you think those people don't take self-custody? What mindset barriers uh, do they have to overcome? I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons here. What's interesting is that there's actually a lot of Bitcoin protected in self-custody and the more Bitcoin that you protect, the more likely you are actually to be self-custodying that Bitcoin, I think, because you're having to protect a much larger value and really think about what are the things that could go wrong here. And um, it's just much more painful to lose a large amount of Bitcoin. And so you're thinking much more seriously about your security. I think that for people who are not comfortable with self-custody, a lot of that comes from really two things. It comes from the fact that this is a very new behavior. For centuries now, we've been securing Bitcoin using, uh, or, or securing money, sorry, using banks, right? Like custodians have been holding our money, our stocks, our bonds for us for centuries. And so it's a very well-worn path to you to trust somebody else to secure your money for you. And the reason that that was all built up so long ago was the fact that money was physical. And so it was much harder to protect and you really needed somebody who specialized in building a bank or, you know, building a building that can be heavily fortified and able to secure money so that uh, individual people didn't have to like think about how they were going to keep this safe in their houses, which was very difficult at the time. So that was why that all started. But what has changed with Bitcoin is just that Bitcoin is now digital money relative to any other point in history. It's very easy for people to self-custody in a secure way and to have a very secure setup that can help them secure anywhere from a couple dollars worth of Bitcoin to you know, thousands of Bitcoin or more. And so I think this is something that is a change in technology that Bitcoin brings, but the human behavior and the comfort with this hasn't quite caught up yet. And then the second big reason why I don't think people self-custody is when they hear what you have to do to self-custody in a secure way, it's a nightmare. And so they just, you know, you're like, you got to have this hardware wallet that you write down this seed phrase for, a seed phrase is, 12 or 24 words. And if you lose it, you lose all your Bitcoin. Make sure somebody doesn't steal it too, because, or to make sure you don't give it to anybody else because then they can steal your Bitcoin. So when you, the way that people have had uh, historically to protect themselves when they're self custodying has just been incredibly difficult. So to us, when we think about this at Casa, we think about how do we help people understand from a human behavior perspective, why this makes sense and why the technology of Bitcoin unlocks self-custody as a new behavior for them and as something that's actually great for their life. And then we also focus a ton on building things that are really simple for people to use because people don't want to spend all their time trying to figure out how to be secure. They just want somebody to tell them how to do it. So it's the same kind of corollary to I'm going to store my gold in a bank because the bank is the security experts that can secure it for me. The 
uh, with Bitcoin, you can secure it yourself, but you still want the security experts to be telling you how to do it. You don't want to spend all of your time becoming a security expert and staying up to date with things. And for a lot of the self-custody solutions that are out there, that's what you have to do. With Casa, what we really try to do is make it so that all you got to do is do what the product tells you to, and you're in great shape. So those are the two main reasons that I think there's been a, like a lot of people when you talk to them, feel hesitant to self-custody. And they're things that, that we're always working to make better. I think also it, it could be um, uh, the, the technical aspect of it is a, is a big one because they come in they're like, oh, like, okay, there's a hardware wallet. Okay, I have a pin. Uh, oh, I have a backup seat press if the hardware wallet gets destroyed. And then, oh, there's like steel wallets. And like, it. I think if, if people hear too many words they don't understand, they, they click off and, and they then uh, go on on their days and like, oh, okay, I, I trusted my money with with banks so why not trust my my bitcoin also with banks so i think like that's a, a huge part of like oh like right. I, th th there are too many words that i don't understand and i just click off i think we we underestimate how big psychology plays into that but do you think we come to a point where self-custody is is something mainstream uh, and something that uh most of the the people will do uh, like most of the bitcoiners will do so I think that from a technology perspective and from a, a product experience perspective, CASA is to the point where self-custody can be mainstream. And actually this has taken quite a bit of time to build up to, but we've re the last couple of major feature releases that we've put out there have really taken huge steps towards making this finally feel like a package that anybody can use to self-custody their Bitcoin and feel comfortable doing it. And that's earlier this year, we released the CASA inheritance feature, which solves the problem of what happens if I die um, and I'm self-custodying my Bitcoin. How do I make sure that my family can access that? And then the second feature that we just released a um, little over a month ago is being able to use a YubiKey as part of your CASA setup. And so one of the main friction points that we have always seen was that while all of the CASA software was very easy for people to use, using a hardware wallet and going to the hardware wallet manufacturer's software interface always was pretty, it was, it was a pretty big hurdle for people who didn't know what they were doing and who weren't already comfortable with hardware wallets. So the YubiKey is a very simple way for people to hold a Bitcoin key offline in cold storage on a dedicated device and then use it with CASA software in a way where it's just a tap in order to uh, sign or transact with the key that's held on that YubiKey. And so it's a, I, I really think that we've hit on this perfect solution where we can take this more mainstream now because we've really solved all the edge case problems like inheritance. And then we've also solved the user experience problem with YubiKeys. And so um, I think this is something that over time, the vast majority of people will shift to having at least some of their Bitcoin in self-custody. You're always going to have you know, people who diversify their risk or who they want to keep some on an exchange because they uh, trade with it more often or whatever they want to do with it. But I think that from a, a technology perspective, we are there. And now it's about telling that story in a way that everybody understands, hey, we've solved a lot of these problems. Here's why you should care about self-custody. Here's why the exchange or custodian that you're keeping your Bitcoin with is not as safe as you think. And you should take that responsibility into your own hands because nobody cares as much as you do about protecting your own money. And that's something that I think is a is a big misconception or has been a big misconception for Bitcoiners so far because they're like, well, I don't really know how to do this. So I'm going to trust that this company over here will do a better job than me because it's there. It's part of their technology stack. It's part of what they've built and they're going to, they're going to do a better job than me at securing this. And I think that depending on the company you're working with, that um, could be true. But even if 
they are doing a better job than you without the right tools would do, there's still a bunch of points of vulnerability because of how Bitcoin works as a at its base as money with irreversible transactions based on cryptography and private keys and a decentralized network of nodes and miners that makes it not a good fit for custodial solutions. It's actually just a much better fit from a security perspective for self-custody. And so as people start to understand that, understand some of those risks and, um, and then realize, oh, I don't have to go this alone. I can use a company like Casa to help me do this easily. I think that's how we, we see this flip and more and more people adopting self-custody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the YubiKey one is, is really interesting uh, as I worked a little bit in IT security and I know all my IT security friends are crazy about YubiKey. <laughs> Everyone is like, yeah, use YubiKey for your passwords. Like even for your, all your log logins, you should have YubiKey uh, there. So I, I know YubiKey uh, knew that before you, I think you announced it on, on uh, in the Nashville conference. I think yep. uh, the, the first time you, you told you told about that. Um yep. Obviously, it's way more user friendly. A, a, a Ubiquit, it's just a tap, and it's it's a easier setup. Are there any backdrops to it? Are there any disadvantages to it? Uh, or is there any level where you're like, okay, if you if you have that many Bitcoin, it really makes sense to to use hardware wallets. Is there any uh, difference between using hardware wallets versus using the Ubiquis? Yeah, there is. So the main difference between hardware wallets and Ubiquis is that. Um, a hardware wallet has the ability to actually verify and sign Bitcoin transactions on the device itself. Whereas a YubiKey can't do that today. And so the way that we've integrated YubiKeys is we, like a hardware wallet, we are storing the actual Bitcoin key on the YubiKey device. And so you get cold storage for 99% of this key's existence. And that's what really matters, right? It's one of the most important pieces of self-custody is you want to make sure that you have keys that are stored on offline devices. Um, so some part of the trade-off is that when you use a YubiKey with Casa, the way that it works is that key is stored on the YubiKey. You plug it into your computer in order to sign a Bitcoin transaction and the YubiKey decrypts the Bitcoin key sends that Bitcoin key to the CASA software, which signs with the key on the transaction that you're actually doing at the time, and then throws the key away all in the same function. So the key is not stored on CASA's servers. It's never stored in CASA's software, but the key becomes hot basically, which means it, it touches an online device for that split second where it's signing a transaction. And so by that nature, that's going to make it less secure than a hardware wallet. And that's why we call it, instead of calling it cold storage or a cold key, we actually call YubiKeys cool keys because they're cold for the majority of that key's life. But then the couple of times when you're actually using it, it becomes a hot key. So why are we comfortable with this? We're comfortable with it because this is part of the overall CASA security model where that YubiKey, that the Bitcoin key that's on that YubiKey is not the only key protecting your Bitcoin. It's part of a multi-sig where you need multiple keys to move any Bitcoin. And so the compromise of any one key becomes less important. And it's more about how do you secure the whole set of keys and what are the different trade-offs of each type of key that you're using in order to give you the best balance between simplicity and security. And so that's why we feel comfortable with YubiKeys as one of the types of keys. And you can set up your CASA multisig where you've got one of your keys on a YubiKey and then one or more of your keys on hardware wallets too. And so that way you still get that benefit from the hardware wallet, but the YubiKey is, uh, replaces one of your hardware wallets where it just makes it a little bit easier overall when you're going to transact. Maybe you use that YubiKey as part of a, a CASA inheritance setup so that your family, your spouse, um, if they were going to be 
they needed to access your Bitcoin in a scenario where you passed away, they have an easier key to use than trying to figure out how to use a hardware wallet, which a lot of people are intimidated by. And so it's part of an overall security setup. So yes, you take a little bit of a security hit from a typical hardware wallet, but when you take into account the security of the entire system, it's actually still really solid and really strong. But Casa offers uh, both with card, uh, with hardware wallets and with uh, UBK. So like there's like, you can basically choose what, what you prefer as an individual. Yeah, exactly. So you can, you can, you, you can use UB keys, you can use hardware wallets. We have the ability to have one key that's on your phone. And then there's also always a key held by Casa. And so you, you have this nice mix of different types of devices, different types of key storage ranging from cold to hot that really lets you set up a robust, usable security system. And this feels, uh, to people who are new, this might feel like a lot. It might feel like a lot of decisions that they got to make. We make a lot of these decisions for you in the product. We guide you through the product in a way that you, we have very strong defaults basically so that you can just go with what we are telling you to do. But then um, if you don't want to take that default path, then you can change things up for to, to match your situation. And we still support a a very broad range of other hardware wallets and devices that can help you do that securely. Interesting. Um, I think collaborative custody has a lot of very unique, very interesting advantages. Um, why do you think that, uh, I mean, you could also have uh, started a company just advising people on self-custody and, and do them do all the keys themselves. Like um, there are other companies uh, that just do that. Um, why did you choose to make a company where there is uh, intentionally one key with the company and two or uh, four other keys with, with the with the uh, client? What, what advantages uh, does that bring? Well, I think it gives people a lot of peace of mind. They always know that they're going to be able to access the CASA key. And so if they make a mistake, lose one, lose two of their keys. The CASA key is always there to be one signature that they need in order to access their Bitcoin. And as much as we say, don't trust verify in Bitcoin, we are humans and humans want to trust people. Like go back to wanting to trust custodians in, in at the beginning of our discussion, right? We want to, um, trust that somebody knows what they are doing in this area and can help us do it well. And so as we were building CASA, having the CASA key be part of people's setup means they people can trust that we're going to protect that key well. But let's say CASA was ever malicious or CASA was compromised in some way, that one key isn't enough to do anything with our customers' funds by itself. And so it's the right balance between being able to have CASA as a backup, allowing your family to use CASA as a backup in case something bad happens and not having full control and like having to fully trust CASA like you would a custodian. Interesting. Also uh, with, with trust, um, that's a really interesting discussion that I always have on the podcast because I feel like um, sometimes we go too far out of the freedom uh, spectrum where we want to be too independent. Uh, and I explain a little bit what I mean with that. I think we always have dependencies on other people. And I think those are good because if you don't have any dependencies, like the, the, the trash of, 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 of your home will not get carried away. You have to do it yourself. Uh, if, if you have, uh, no, no other people that help you in any way or shape or form, you're basically yourself in, in the woods and, and forests and <laughs> fighting against animals. I think the, the, the freedom aspect is like, you should not be free of any other human being, but you should be free in your decision making. So I like collaborative, uh, um, models a lot because we, do trust other human beings and we should trust other human beings yeah. uh, like a bus driver that we trust that he will not crash the bus and stuff like that. Right. Like, uh, trust uh, to a certain extent is good as long as we have the control. So I, I like the model where uh, you, you have trust uh, in someone else, but you still have the control over your keys, especially with, with Bitcoin and, and uh, possibilities of that. 
What I was also uh, is interesting for me is um, when we look at the future of, of self custody. Do you think that uh, Casa is in the future kind of kind of the future model of a Bitcoin bank where uh, you only help uh, customers how to to help the Bitcoin? Maybe even with like um, models uh, above that. I think Unchained has that uh, where they have like loans on, on Bitcoin. So they, they, they make something with that. I'm not familiar with their product, but uh, I heard something around that. Do you think that this is the way to go where banks will in the future just hold like one out of five keys uh, and have then products around that, banking products even around that? Uh, do you see that that is the, the future or how do you see that? I think it does change how we approach the banking model overall because the banking model right now is all about taking in assets from taking in deposits from customers and then going and lending those deposits out to people to in order to generate a return for the bank and then some of that return gets paid back to the depositors but you know his, historically it was a lot larger than it is these days these days it's a very small amount so the way that this changes is I think that to date until Bitcoin was invented, you had no other choice besides I have to put my money in a bank. And so I have to allow the bank to lend out my money because if you don't want the bank to lend out your money, then the only thing you can do is like stuff cash in a mattress basically. And that's just not reasonable or practical for, for people to do. So uh, now you can, secure your own money. You don't have to give it to a bank with the equivalent of a mobile app and a YubiKey. And so it's something that can fit in your pocket and you can hold, be holding millions, tens of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin in your pocket. And that change in technology is really powerful and really has the potential to change the banking model because now banks have to think about what are all the services that I provide around this custody model instead of just how do I aggregate assets in order to lend them out for um, ba based on the depositors that are holding their money with me in the bank. And so now that maybe changes the banking model where um, banks have to make it more attractive to people to offer them some assets that they can go lend out to other people. So instead of it being very small interest rates that you get on your deposits, maybe you need higher interest rates in order to convince people to take some of their capital out of self custody and give it to the bank for lending. So I think that banks in this model, they start to focus a lot more on the services around what they offer and they have to make those actually competitive again. And people always have this exit path to self custody in this scenario where, um, you know, today you actually don't, uh, you haven't had that. So when you look back at the SVB, uh, Silicon Valley bank meltdown, um, about a year ago, year and a half ago, when Silicon Valley bank, which is where a bunch of startups were keeping their money when they were going under and everybody was worried about it. And there was a run on the bank. There was no option really for people to self custody those dollars. I mean, it's very difficult to get those into like Bitcoin or stable coins in short notice and then bring it to self custody. Right. And so what are people doing? Everybody's on these threads with other startup founders being like, what banks are you getting accounts opened at? Where can we go that's not going to fail? Uh, people were wondering about all these different banks potentially failing, and there was really not a good way to, um, to judge whether a bank was sound or not in that time where banks everywhere were under a lot of pressure. And so what I think is really interesting from a societal change perspective is if we can use self-custody as the exit valve for that, where then people can be able to very easily take their money out of a bank and protect it themselves in a way that they know that money is safe. And I think that's a really great net benefit to society of self-custody and of, of what Bitcoin has pioneered here. And so that's something that we're, we're excited about. And, and I don't know that, like to go back to your original question, maybe banks start holding 
keys for people. I think that would make sense as part of their, their traditional security model of helping secure people's money evolving. But I think that even more important is just providing this option of an exit valve for people when they're not sure whether the bank is doing what they should be with their assets and they want to make sure that they can protect it themselves. I love that exit valve uh, analogy because I feel like uh, it's so important. Uh, we have Bitcoin as an exit valve from the fiat system. Uh, we have, even in the social media landscape, we have Nostra as an exit valve to, to Twitter. We have Twitter yeah. as an exit valve from, from Facebook, uh, kind of. So it's, it's interesting, uh, just the, um, just the sheer existence of an exit wealth uh, makes the existing system better. So it could even, I think, short term make even the fiat system better and more um, uh, robust because then maybe banks are like, yeah, like we, we should really take care of it because people are fleeing to, to Bitcoin. Now they have something to actually flee to that is actually globally working, not like gold that you can right. confiscate later. So that's, that's an interesting comparison uh, uh, to make. Yeah, really cool and i i want our like i i i think this is important for people who are making regulations to be thinking about too like politicians in government because um i think that what we've done over the decades is just build up more and more regulation around banks in order to make sure that they're doing the right thing with customers money and it all boils down to the principal agent problem right it's like the bank is not you they're acting on behalf of you in storing your money and so they are never going to be as incentivized as you to take care of your money and so we gotta in order to fix that we have to put in all these guardrails and we just keep building more and more guardrails on banks to make sure that they're not messing up with all of their customers money and the ultimate solution to that is to allow customers to withdraw to a simple, secure, digital self-custody in a way that provides that exit valve and doesn't require forcing the banks to comply with more and more regulations. It just forces them through capitalism and through the market to be better at securing their customers' Bitcoin because now they know that their customers can always take their their money to elsewhere to self custody and to protect it themselves. A two part question: um, How how do you see um, yourself and and Casa uh, no KYC and privacy for 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 the services that you offer? Uh, do you collect any data, or how do you see that? No, so we um, as a software provider that is not a custodian that doesn't do money transmission, we do not need to, we're not required by government laws to KYC our customers, just like a, you know, whatever app that you decide to download online isn't required to KYC its customers. And so um, this is important to us because more and more data breaches are happening that cause really big problems for the people that are part of those data breaches. I mean, phishing, around people's Bitcoin has become a rampant problem. And it's gotten very sophisticated and it all stems from information that comes out in data breaches that allows people to be targeted for, and, and to be targeted for trying to steal their Bitcoin. And so um, for us, we don't wanna collect that information. We don't want to make CASA into a honeypot. And so unlike some of the other solutions out there, you can sign up for CASA under a completely anonymous email with Proton Mail and not give us any of your personal identifying information. And that's great because we don't want that information because we don't want to have to protect that against a data breach. And when we do collect information like this, we actually try to delete it when we're done with it in order to make sure that we aren't storing it. So part of the CASA offering is um, at some of the higher membership plans is that you can actually uh, get a box sent to you with all the hardware, like YubiKeys, hardware wallets, Faraday bags, all the things that you need to set up a CASA 3 of 5 multi-sig vault. And when we send, we need, we need your address to send you the box. So after we send you the box, 
we actually delete your address from our system once we know you have it and once you've gotten all the way onboarded. And that way, we don't have to keep that info. It's not a risk to you. And it's overall just a better privacy and security posture for our customers. For companies that are keeping that info for longer periods of time, um, they are risking their customers physical security. And so that's something that we are really careful with. And you can even use a PO box uh, for, for the address, right? You, you don't have to have your self home address for, for the delivery. Right. Yeah. As long as you can get access to the, wherever it's being mailed, you can use whatever address you want. And I think that's really important because then uh, even Casa um, themselves is uh, protecting it against maybe a compliance <laughs> request from a, a government saying like, hey, um, you have uh, customer funds. Uh, we would like to know <laughs> what are the customers. And you can say like, oh, we don't know. Like <laughs> we have, we, we right. have no clue. Like you, 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 can, you don't even have the data to, to put out that. I think that's a really important thing uh, for Bitcoiners and a really important thing also for, for that kind of a service. Yeah, and uh, I think really people don't always, uh, I think for whatever reason, people assume that um, CASA needs to KYC people or that we only serve certain, like the US or something like that. We serve people globally and we don't KYC. And so uh, this is a better business proposition for us and it's a better privacy proposition for our customers. Absolutely, very cool. Um, one thing that I ask myself a little bit, if we don't get the self custody route, we we say like uh, most of the people stay in exchanges, stay in uh, Bitcoin banks that actually hold all the keys, and and people don't. We we are not successful with <laughs> um, having people self custody. Um, do you feel like? that could be a systemic risk to the, the Bitcoin or is just the existence of an exit wealth with self-custody enough to make Bitcoin uh, secure uh, from a monetary perspective? I think the exit valve helps, but it's still a systemic risk to Bitcoin if the vast majority of Bitcoin is held by custodians. And that's because that just, it creates a honeypot for somebody to try and access and steal from. So whether that somebody is like hackers, even very sophisticated hackers, like from North Korea, or a government that decides that it's going to outlaw Bitcoin. This happened in, in the United States. They actually outlawed, and they made it illegal to hold gold as an individual. And so all the gold that was stored in banks was forcibly converted into dollars and the government seized all the gold and brought it to its own faults. This could happen again with Bitcoin if the majority of Bitcoin is sitting on exchanges. And so I think that um, it can be a systemic risk to Bitcoin to, to have most of it sitting with custodians just because it's very identifiable where it is at that point. The I think it's also systemically risky for the broader financial system for our country. And when I say our country, I mean the U S but other countries around the world too. And I think that's because it just continues building on the existing legacy system that we have with the banking and financial system. And like I was saying earlier, we've had to build so many regulations and guardrails around this to protect against systemic risk because of all the conflicts of interest that are inherent throughout that system. And so it's actually people's best interest to exit that system through self-custody and to do that, not just for yourself, but for the system as a whole, to make sure that Bitcoin as a monetary system evolves correctly and doesn't just rebuild what we've already built and are trying to replace or or significantly improve with the legacy financial system. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
their Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way i love that a lot really, really cool do you, do you see uh the etf uh with with coinbase i think most of the etfs help hold their bitcoin with etfs uh, with, with, with coinbase uh, and it's it's a it's a quite a good amount of Bitcoin that they already accumulated uh, in not even the first year. Do you see that as a potential honeypot that might be, I think it could not be a systemic risk to Bitcoin because it's not enough Bitcoin at this point, but could it be in a major, medium, short-term uh, event that is bad for Bitcoin? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even the US government thinks that this could be a systemic risk to Bitcoin. The FBI put out like a notice two days ago or yesterday, one of the two, that was basically saying they are aware of sophisticated state actors from North Korea targeting ETF issuers and custodians. And it was part of a broader kind of bulletin where they were saying, you know, they're targeting individuals and other types of institutions as well, but they specifically list the ETF participants as part of the targets, which makes sense because it's a giant honeypot sitting there at Coinbase. And so, of course, Coinbase has a lot of security precautions built in. They've got um, a lot of different ways that they're trying to prevent sophisticated hackers and social engineers from accessing that, but it's still a real risk. And in a lot of ways, security is a whack-a-mole game where, you know, the attackers and defenders are always jockeying back and forth and trying to get a one up on the other. And you can look at just the ongoing stream of zero day vulnerabilities. We get a few every year where core systems like iPhones, MacBooks, Google Chrome, Windows computers, et cetera, are, are uh, exploited with a vulnerability that hasn't been found or known, which is why it's called a zero day since it was created and it comes out Apple or Microsoft or whoever patches it as fast as possible. And maybe it gets uh, exploited in the wild. Maybe not. If some of these things happen with some of the big custodians, that is a way that the attackers win that game or score a point in that game. And maybe they get all the Bitcoin, maybe they only get some of the Bitcoin, but either way, it's bad for Bitcoin. And so I was thinking about this a little bit earlier today, actually. And I was thinking about uh, kind of a metaphor. It's like what a custodian or what Coinbase is doing with all the Bitcoin is they're building this castle 
and they're building all these layers of walls around this castle. And then they've got little gates in each wall that you can get through in order to move Bitcoin in and out of this castle. But it's still just one castle and you just need to figure out how to get through all the gates properly or climb the walls or whatever it is. And then you can get what's inside the castle. Whereas a model like Casa, you have Casa sitting at the center building software, but there's no Bitcoin sitting with Casa. And then you can just draw all these lines out to each of Casa's customers, which are their own mini castle that have their own walls protecting them and a smaller amount of Bitcoin sitting there. And each of those targets is just much less juicy for the effort that you have to put in in order to compromise it. The juice isn't worth the squeeze. And so when you distribute the risk like that, you create a bunch of individual castles all across the countryside to carry the metaphor slightly too far and end up in a scenario where it's a lot harder to compromise a very large amount of Bitcoin. And so the systemic risk to the Bitcoin system is just so much lower. And so anything we can do to drive towards that future versus that future where we're centralizing everything with a couple of providers and we have to protect that with our life is, I think, a much better type of situation and future that we want to live in. It's an amazing uh, metaphor. I love that a lot. It also s shows um, like banking, it, they're all castles basically like uh, you hear it so many times that a bank account got hacked because yeah it's like a centralized entity uh and and sometimes it's really uh maybe even easy to to guess someone's password or like to right. get the two factor authentication like uh banks like uh, it's it's so interesting when, when people ask me oh how can you sleep with all the bitcoin like i'm like how can you sleep with a bank account that has more than i don't know five thousand or ten thousand euros on it like i could not sleep with that uh that that would freak me out um, but when we come to that metaphor uh, and we have a society where there's not like big castles everywhere where a lot of big honeypots are, but there is like uh, way smaller castles and very distributed uh, castles with line between each other, like there are, of course, dependencies, but they are, they are their own castles. Um, like a casa uh, and their client because the client has at any time the ability to, to move the Bitcoin without casa's help uh, and, and uh, casa has basically no control over their uh, castle, <laughs> castle casa. Yeah. Uh, um, what will that do to um, humanity uh, and society when we move from a, a centralized system where we are used to someone else takes care of our things to we are taking care of our own things with help of of someone else still but we are decentralizing the responsibility because um even a uh i mean casa makes a great job in 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 uh, making it uh, failure proof but if a client really wants to he can make a mistake so like the responsibility is still on on yeah. on, on the client side uh, what will that do to, to humanity and society I think if you look at a lot of scenarios in humanity, when you give people more responsibility, they improve the quality of how they act. Maybe this is most applicable in kids, for example, like when you're with somebody else's kids, you don't have responsibility for them. You feel like, you know, you, it's, it's okay. Right. But when it's your kids and you have responsibility for raising them, protecting them, making sure they turn out to be good humans, the amount that you care goes up significantly. Or when you're in a workplace situation and you're just being told what to do all day and somebody else makes all the decisions, you don't really care. You're just kind of punching in and out. But when you give somebody responsibility, you allow them to make decisions over things themselves. Suddenly the quality of their work, how much they actually care goes up significantly. And so there's something ingrained in us as humans that when we feel like we actually own something, we care about it more. And 
money is one of the most important things in our lives as humans because we use it to sustain ourselves. We use it to keep ourselves alive, to fill our needs, to fill our wants. It helps. It's, you know, the oil of society basically and of capitalism. And so making people responsible for that or, or giving them the option to be responsible for that, I think changes how people think about their money and changes how people value their money. And then this spreads beyond just money, right? So private keys give you the ability to actually own data. So in the case of Bitcoin, that data is just your money. Um, but that could be your online identity, like on Noster. It could be your content, like on Noster. It could be communications, like over encrypted communication apps, like Signal or Proton or whatever it is. It could be your personal files. And so all of these things can be made better and put into people's control for the first time ever, thanks to cryptography and private keys. And I think that that really changes how people think about their responsibility. It really changes how people value a thing and it, and it allows them to actually protect it themselves for the first time ever. And so that to me, a more responsible, autonomous society where we rely less on somebody who's just telling us, you know, do this, do this, do this, or who just goes off and handles all the things for us and is more like helping us to make the right decisions around how we secure what matters most to us. I think that's a, a good, better evolution for society than what, than what we've had so far. It's very intangible, right? Like it's a, it's kind of a vague idea. We haven't seen it come to full fruition. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, this is exactly how people are going to act. I think I, I'm not always a huge fan of like the, the Bitcoin fixes this meme where it's like, you know, if you fix this one thing with the money, that's going to spiral out to fix every single problem the world has. I, I don't buy into that, but I do think that there's subtle impacts from doing that and that it can help people live a better life and one where they feel like they have more control and responsibility, which overall improves the quality of life and how much they care about those things. I have an amazing end routine question for you because in the end routine, we have a question from the previous guest uh, that, that fits so nicely in, but I will keep it for the end routine. Um, okay. I had uh, two days ago, a podcast where someone said a quote to me that I just wrote down and it is so nice. And I, I, I put it up because I, I don't want to mess this up. So I will read it to you. A kid that isn't allowed to do anything will be an adult that doesn't do anything. I love that so much. Uh, and, and he brought it up also in Bitcoin perspective. And I think that's what you're also talking about, where when where, where when we get the control back, this, this allows uh, society really to, to thrive again. And I love also your analogy, not only with money, uh, so with Bitcoin giving the control back to it, but it has the possibilities to give us with Nostra our social media accounts back because all of a sudden Nostra is a protocol and you can take your followers your connections your whatever you want to call it uh, back and you really can uh, own it and not the client so not damos or not any other uh, nostra client owns it which is an amazing thing as as a content creator i can <laughs> say it's like it's a hustle to build on youtube then on x and then on rumble and then on all other platforms all at the same time and you have to produce one video and you upload it to five different platforms and those yep. platforms distribute it further it's a it's a hustle um so that's an amazing thing. And I think the, the most significant amount that, that I'm always thinking of with, with data sharing is also medical data, for example, when I'm like, yeah. okay, I should own my medical data. Uh, and the, the, the uh, doctors should ask me, oh, can you share that data with me? Then temporarily I share it with him. Not he has a file on me and I have to ask him like, hey, <laughs> what, what is in my file? So like there, there are a lot of uh, trickle down effects from uh, that uh, from that revolution. And uh, obviously I think money is the biggest one from all of them. Uh, but from that, we, we can move forward and move in so many small and different ways uh, forward. I, I love that analogy. So thank you for that cool, cool, cool input uh, of yours. Yeah, of, yeah course. of course. I, I definitely agree. And I think that um, 
It's, it's interesting, like anybody who builds consumer products, I think runs into scenarios where you just see people acting in ways that mm, actually that's kind of a weird tangent. We can, I'm not going to go down that tangent. We can cut that out. I, but anyway, it's, it's like, I think it's interesting to me, but it's probably not very applicable. So never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. It yeah. happens to me uh, all the time. Uh, I have a thought. I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> I should have uh, f thought that. And then one, one thing that, um, there are a few more things that I want to go through, but, sure. uh, one thing that I'm interested in is, uh, future threat models to uh, all of that. I think a lot of people are also interested in, in okay, what, what is the threat model of, of maybe AI uh, doing to uh, Bitcoin uh, on my self custody solution? Because AI, I like, for example, I'm a high, high user of ChatGPT. It, it helps with the podcast business so much, like yeah. from writing tags that are optimized for search engine optimization from writing descriptions. Uh, and, and I have people on like, Oh, how do you write all those great uh, descriptions for your podcast? And I'm like, I don't, yeah. <laughs> what, what yeah. AI does that? Like, uh, how is that possible? Uh, and I just like consented now to ChatGPT. I think they rolled it out today, at least for my computer where they can learn now from each chat and the combining that information from, from you. So like one chat is not, uh, yeah. that, um, how dangerous of a threat model do you see it when AI is taking over the computer? It's like Apple has their own AI built in, uh, and basically you can just like, Hey Siri, uh, what is that? And they have all the information about you, what, what, you, what you plugged in. If you plugged in a, a UBK, they know all of those things. Um, do, do you see that uh, as a, as a positive, uh, potential threat model to uh, self custody? And do we have to maybe in the future? even go to like air gapped things and, and, and go a little bit further down the, the security route to get it uh, away from the machines to make it more secure. How do you, how do you see? That's a great question. I think, so there's a couple of things that I think are important to think about with threat modeling on the AI perspective. So, um, the, to go specifically to the question that you were just talking about. I don't think we're there yet today. Like, I, I don't think that we're in a point where the AI is going to be able to steal your private key out of the secure element on your phone or something like that. I think um, it's, there's a level of trust, I think, that people are putting into Apple or some of the the companies that are building with AI to, and the companies that build the hardware and the secure elements and that kind of thing to not open up those secure elements and open up attack vectors that then the, the AI can utilize. That's the whole point of a secure element on a phone, right? It's like, this is a separate chip that can only has very strict permissioning around it in order to utilize the, the encryption and decryption capabilities. So I think that for now we can probably trust that that will continue to be handled in the way that it should be. I think um, if we get to a point where we have like ASI, artificial super intelligence or something like that, then that might be something that we have to consider a little bit more and understand what are the, the safeguards that have been put in around what this can access within your system. And if, there, if the safeguards aren't very clearly strong enough, then yeah, it probably makes sense to move towards more of an air gapped model. And so that's something that you can do with Casa today. I think that's a future that we're, we're totally down to live in and build for. And it'll, it'll all just be about making like the right balance, I guess, between simplicity and security. And so you, you have to think about, okay, there's going to be a portion of my Bitcoin that I want more ready access to that I want to spend more regularly for that. I'm willing to keep it on a less secure device and a less secure setup. Then there's going to be like my main savings. And for that, I want to have it in a much more secure setup, multi-sig, potentially air gapped, all of those things. And so you can kind of build up that security model for yourself based on the threat vectors that you're seeing. And I think that with AI, it's something that we really got to pay close attention to 
And when it gets smarter, really evaluate whether we need to shift model to where private keys are only held on like dumb devices and never leave the device basically. Um, the other thing that I think is important with AI is just that AI is getting better and better at copying humans. And one of the things that really gets a lot of people today, so everybody worries about these catastrophic events, right? Like people are worried about the artificial superintelligence stealing everybody's Bitcoin. People are worried about the uh, hack of Coinbase where all the Bitcoin goes away at once because they breached the walls and got in. What's actually probably the biggest and most practical threat right now is individual social engineering and phishing where tons of people are trying to spending their time trying to hack individuals who are kind of unsuspecting today. And so that job gets way easier with AI where you can use AI to help you sound more like somebody and to help build up a story that helps you to socially engineer someone, someone else and use that to get access to their Bitcoin. And so there's some pretty sophisticated stuff happening already today without the help of AI. Now you add in the ability for AI to impersonate somebody's family, impersonate somebody for a SIM swap in order to pass voice recognition. I actually was just talking to somebody else today where they got, it was the CEO, they were talking about somebody they knew who was the CEO of a large company and they got SIM swapped because the attacker used AI to impersonate their voice and pass the voice checks that the phone company had in place. And so that's something that, um, you know, AI as a tool to impersonate is only, is only getting stronger. And I think that is much more real in the short term than like the super intelligence that goes and steals everything from us. So the way to protect against that is actually through cryptography because you can verify authenticity, verify that somebody is who they say they are using private key, private public key crypt cryptography, which is the one thing that today an AI can't break because it would take all the computing power in the world, millions of years to break one private public key pair. And so I think that's a really interesting component of this that actually in the war against impersonation by AI, cryptography is our best weapon. And so that's something that we're thinking a lot about at CASA and that I think we're going to see more of in how people build out their security model going forward. That's a really interesting thought uh, because all of a sudden you can uh, imitate someone's voice I mean, to a certain extent, even this video and those things are just starting to develop. Like uh, we, we, we're just starting to see those voices and those videos of, of, of people and the images and uh, the, the not right now, the, the AI memes of like politicians uh, with Trump and Kamala and Elon Musk and, and then uh, they, they are robbing a bank. Like th that meme, I think got really viral. Uh, it's really interesting to, to see and funny to see those memes, but it shows that we are at the starting of impersonating basically everyone. And for someone like me, that's really scary because I have so much training data publicly available. <laughs> like yeah, I have totally. literally like now what, 237 podcasts. So yeah. I, everyone ar around one hour to two hours. That's a lot of training data to make a really impressive looking Robin Sire that can uh, be maybe uh yeah, basically saying exactly how I say it and, and you yeah. say it. And interesting enough, like Riverside offers that feature, the Riverside platform where we are recording right now to voice clone myself. Yeah. So I can actually make advertisement announcement and stuff like that. Only voice, of course, um, with that. And I tried that feature out. Uh, and I typed in text and I sent it, uh, to, to my girlfriend and she thought I was it. Like she was tricked yep. by, by that voice message. So I think yep. the, 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 the things that we can already do are really scary. Where yep. to this point, uh, where your romantic partner on a quick voice message, message on a WhatsApp 
doesn't know like oh right. he, he's not him like that that yeah, that's that voice sounds weird no that voice actually <laughs> is not him but you don't recognize it like the the possibilities of that are like uh, endless it's it's really interesting it has has little to know to do with with bitcoin but i think it's a really interesting uh, future that we that we're going through really interesting to, to talk about that yeah i mean the and the thing about it is like you don't want to not have that tool right like it's actually very useful to be able to uh clone yourself and test out a bunch of different kinds of ads without having to record every single version of it and then you can see what resonates the best and maybe you go back and record that version make it perfect quality or whatever it is there's a lot of ways that ai being able to impersonate people is going to be incredibly helpful for us as a tool to run businesses but it's also going to have it's going to be helpful for people that are are looking to do criminal things. And so we need to have protections there that um, we can put in place and new societal norms and behaviors that people can adopt in order to protect against the the new threats that come with that. Very really interesting. Um, before we come closer to the end routine, uh, do you have any um, future things that you can say, like the, the, those things will be developed, uh, uh, on CASA or is the main agenda just to make, uh, self custody more user friendly and more secure over time? Or do you plan to go other avenues a little bit with like what we discussed maybe with Bitcoin banks, but then there's this problem of like having to KVC the customers. It's a new I just thought about that. Uh, is, is there anything like that that uh, you that you can share? Yes. Yeah, so nothing really specific to share today, but we um, we've got some good stuff cooking that I'm excited about. A lot of the near term stuff is just how do we make self custody easier for different types of people. That is a big, very big problem in itself to work on, and I think that's something that we're we're just highly focused on which is why in my very humble and unbiased opinion we're the best way to self-custody on the market that said the broader vision of casa and the broader story is always about been about what private keys can do for humanity and how can we use private keys to enable people like we were talking about earlier to be more free more autonomous to have more control over the things that matter most to them and to take on that responsibility without it feeling like a burden, but with it actually where it feels like something that they want to do that's exciting and that lets them live a better life. And so that's what we're really thinking about over the long term. And then we, um, you know, in, in the path to get there, what we're really focused on is how do we make uh, security simple? And then how do we make security simple, not just for your Bitcoin, but for you as a Bitcoiner? And so I, I was talking about this a little bit at the, when we announced the YubiKey feature on stage at Nashville, but people who own Bitcoin, Bitcoiners, they do need to think about the security of their Bitcoin, but they also need to think about security of other areas of their life. And a lot of people don't know the steps to take here. And so we're really thinking uh, about how do we help people do this in a way that is approachable, in a way that help, helps them be secure, that doesn't take tons and tons of time on their end, but gets like the easy stuff out of the way, gets like a lot of the basics done so that you just become a more difficult target for a random attacker. It's kind of like making yourself, it's like if two people are running from the bear. You just want to be faster than the other person. And so when Casa thinks about how do we offer not just Bitcoin security, we want to offer security for Bitcoiners. We're trying to help you be the faster person in all these different areas of your life that then ties back to securing your Bitcoin. So this is something that we're, we're working on right now. We've got some good stuff coming on that and on a couple of other fronts that I'm excited about. And You'll hear more soon. Really, really cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, one question before the end routine uh, that I kind of have to ask as a Bitcoin only podcast, why support Ethereum? Yeah, good question. We just had so many of our customers saying, hey, I really like storing my Bitcoin with Casa. Can I store my Ethereum with you too? 
Um, and then I think that stable coins are also providing a, a service for people and there's really no stable coins running on Bitcoin today. And so I'd love to see stable coins running on Bitcoin, but there's a lot of people using stable coins practically around the world. And I think that, uh, that was intriguing for us as well. So it was just came down to what our customers were asking us for. And, um, we remain a, a Bitcoin first company and a very Bitcoin focused company. If you look at the things that we have done since releasing the support for Ethereum, all of them are things that are very beneficial for Bitcoiners. And so we continue to believe that Bitcoin is the most important asset out of the ecosystem. That's where we want to spend all of our time. And so I think you, you, uh, we said that we were going to do that when we first announced Ethereum and people were kind of like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like you're probably going to add Solana next or whatever. Um, and you can see by our actions since then that everything we have done and built has been to help Bitcoiners. So I hope that some of the like proof is in the pudding is now out there from a track record perspective over the last year and helps people understand what we're really focused on. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, I have a lot of guests on that uh, not only hold Bitcoin, like it's not a complete Bitcoin maxi show. I even have a lot of guests that hold other cryptocurrencies, even outside of uh, Ethereum. Uh, yeah. It just happens to be that I personally am Bitcoin only. Uh, and it's interesting that with the podcast, I transitioned to way more of... Uh, a soft Bitcoin max, if you, if you, if you say that, like I was way more toxic, uh, if, uh, w w at the time where I was just on X and just putting yeah. out my tweets, then I'm doing it right now because, uh, even if like, uh, I have the, I have the thing where I'm like, okay, it's Bitcoin only. Uh, I don't see any use case in other, other altcoins, but I'm aware of that. I'm just one human being and I right. could be flawed. And, um, no matter what's the outcome, the free market will make the decision anyways. Like if, 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 right, exactly. uh, if, 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 Bit, if Ethereum has absolutely no use case, I don't have to worry about that because then people will flock out of Ethereum and will only uh, have Bit, uh, Bitcoin. One question I have to do, do that any uh, uh, more, is there any technical uh, difference between storing Bitcoin uh, and storing Ethereum is 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 it basically? I have no clue about Ethereum. That's why I'm asking. Is there any yeah. any technical uh, difference in in storing Ethereum? Well, so from a user facing perspective, we tried to make it feel very similar, but under the hood, it's actually wildly different how the different protocols work because they both handle multi sig very differently, and so. We actually built them to be pretty separate in our system so that the, like we, I think we could have compromised on things and tried to like smush it all together and make it like, you know, not two separate security systems. And in that case might have actually degraded the, the benefits of securing Bitcoin with Casa. And we took the approach of saying, no, we want the Bitcoin security to remain rock solid and to not be affected at all by us adding support for Ethereum. And so in order to do that, we had to build it in a way that we kept them very separate and just built based on how the native protocols work. And so that means that they work pretty differently under the hood, but as a user, for the most part, you don't really have to, to think about that. There's like a couple of scenarios where it works slightly differently in the UI, uh, when you're taking different actions, but overall it, it, you know, it doesn't make a ton of difference. It, it all kind of comes down to what's happening underneath that surface. So, um, we've just tried to be very careful about making sure that the Ethereum support doesn't affect the security for the Bitcoin side of things. And I think that that's, that's worked out well for us. Um, and yeah, I agree that Ultimately, it's like a, it's a free market thing because just because we support Ethereum doesn't mean that somebody chooses to invest in Ethereum. And um, we take no stance on like you, whether we're in a Bitcoin maxi or Ethereum maxi or whatever, like Jameson, my 
co-founder loves to shit on Ethereum on Twitter or X. And that's fine. Like, fine. But he also realizes that we got a bunch of customers that want to store their Ether with Casa. And so that's as a business, it just, that's what we decided to do. And so um, I think that the free market, it, it's it's a very, free markets are a very Bitcoin aligned principle, right? And so just like you said, if Bitcoin gets more adoption than Ethereum, it's going to outperform as an asset. And what we've seen this year is significant outperformance from of Bitcoin versus Ethereum as an asset. And um, so I, I think that that's the free market at work. We'll see if that changes. But in the meantime, it's not our, jo- our job to tell our customers what they can and can't invest in. It's just our job to respond to our customers' security needs. Yeah, as a, co- as a company, you're here to serve. I, I get that a lot. Really, really cool. Um, also, like from a b- performance performance of Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, the one metric that I track always with Bitcoin versus Ethereum is the metric starting when they switched from proof of work to proof of stake. And it's really interesting. Since they did it, it was like 2020. Uh, I forgot the month, but I think it was in the middle or end of 2022. Um, where they, they switched from proof of work to proof of stake. And since then, it actually, um, what was it? Was Bitcoin going up 50% against it or was Ethereum going down 50%? I, I forgot, but at, at least like the, the difference between the Bitcoin and the Ethereum price is significant since then. Like if a Bitcoin has performed so much better since uh, uh, Ethereum switched, um, I have... As, as I said, like, I have no clue why this is because like, I've, I'm not in an Ethereum at all. Uh, I only know why Bitcoin will be going up in the long term. Yeah. <laughs> I have a whole podcast around that, but, uh, Ethereum, uh, it's, it's interesting how they, how they switch that system. And whether the proof of work versus proof of stake is what did it or something else, like, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why Bitcoin could outperform ETH. I think that uh ethereum has a lot more competitors like there's a bunch of different chains out there trying to be the smart contract computing chain for bitcoin it's done a pretty good job of winning that money use case and so i think that uh that's a you know a big difference from like a if you think about it almost from like a product market fit perspective and a a marketing perspective of like is this clearly the best thing for this use case? And I think Bitcoin's just really nailed that for money. Really, really cool. Uh, as we're coming closer to the end, um, even though there, there's so many uh, re- really interesting conversation with you, um, the one question that I ask all my guests in the end is, what can we learn from all, besides all the things uh, about the Bitcoin topics? Wait, let me say that again. I completely uh, made <laughs> fail, fail that now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was not even understandable. What can we learn from you besides all the topics that we already talked about in Bitcoin? So I think probably one of the lessons that you can learn from me and just my experience as a person is that you don't have to be this perfect, like hmm, the word specimens coming to mind, but that's not quite right. You don't have to be a perfect fit or like have the perfect plan for a certain type of role. And so let me just be more specific to like add some clarity to that. I was not the original CEO of Casa and I actually started my career doing finance, like something totally different than what I'm doing today. And eventually decided I wanted to get into tech and startups because I wanted to have more responsibility over what I was working on and what I was building. And I took like a job just at a random tech startup where I knew some of the people that were working there and I was working in operations. So it was a travel tech startup where you, um, we would uh, let you order food from your phone at the airport. And so the first job that I took just to get into the tech world was in operations for them where I was going into airports and like physically installing effectively DoorDash tablets so that people could order food from their phone and doing all the integrations like overnight, like pulling all nighters in airports, doing these things. And it was, you know, it was fun 
but it was nothing even close to like what I'm doing today. But I kind of worked there in that role for a while and then moved over into doing product management for the same company and got that opportunity there, thankfully to them and learned a bunch doing that. And then kind of over and over again, just made these little changes in my career and eventually ended up uh, joining Casa as one of the early employees and as head of product. And then I just tried to do good work at Casa and was really, um, you know, passionate about the problem that we have been working on. And then at the end of 2019, which was about a year and a half into me working at Casa, um, the previous CEO decided to step down. There were some family health issues involved and he asked me to take over as CEO. And I had no idea how to be a CEO. And I was like totally feeling in over my head and only thanks to help from a couple of close friends and some of our investors was I able to figure out like what the heck I should do. We almost ran out of money. We had like not, you know, 30 days or 45 days of cash left basically when I took over as CEO. It was a very difficult time for the company, but we pulled together as a team and supported each other and were made it through and and now are doing very well as a company. And so I think when somebody like looks in from the outside, maybe it's easy to feel like, you know, I could never do something like that. But I think what it always boils down to is you can do these things. You just have to try and you have to try your best to do a good job at something and out of that good things will come. And so, you know, I, every new employee that joins CASA, I give them this, uh, culture talk basically. And we talk through all the ways that we work at CASA, what our values are, what our mission is, all that. But the, the very last slide that I have in my presentation is a slide that says, uh, who you will become is who you decide to be. And this is something that has been, has really been important to me as a person because it helps me remember that future me is just a, it's just present me plus all of the decisions that I make between now and that whatever future point in time that I choose. And I think that that's something that's very empowering in one hand and comforting in the other hand, because yes, there may be these kind of random curveballs that life throws at you, but the, the main constant in your life is you and the decisions that you make. And so I think that that is a very like encouraging thing for me personally. And if you had asked me back when I first took that job in operations at that tech startup, if I thought that I would be the CEO of a company of a size that Casa is today, I would not have believed it. And so I think the lesson there is you can do whatever you want. You just have to do the thing and then try hard at it. I love that a lot. Thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. Um, really cool. We are already uh, very close to, <laughs> to, to the end of the podcast. Um, the end routine of the podcast is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. And I already teased it before a little bit uh, because you said uh, Bitcoin doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve everything. Uh, and it's interesting because your question from the previous guest is, what do you think Bitcoin doesn't solve? Hmm. Yeah, that is a good tie-in. I think uh, this isn't going to be a great answer. I think there's a lot of things that Bitcoin doesn't solve about human nature. Like, I think that sometimes people say like, suddenly Bitcoin is going to make us these like more altruistic beings with longer time preferences that are only thinking about the future and only like building for this glorious future, not being selfish in the present, etc. And I just think that that while that is true, sometimes there's also just a lot of human nature that is built up around like, what do I want right now? What am I feeling right now? How do I make sure I'm feeling good right now? And 
Bitcoin can't fix that. Probably a lot of like Bitcoin plus like a lot of meditation and, you know, time spent analyzing your own psychology and the wisdom of life as you get older and older. That's like the real recipe to, to fix that. But I don't think Bitcoin fundamentally changes who we are as people for in that really, really deep way. But I think it can be a tool to allow people to better express who they are as people. And it can be a tool to, for the people that, um, you know, want to take on more responsibility, want that freedom, want that autonomy that Bitcoin can provide and that cryptography can provide. I think it's a, it's a tool that they've never had before. And so that enables some of those behaviors that, um, just haven't been practical or possible before, but does it fundamentally change human nature and, and turn you into this perfectly healthy eating, um, or only meat eating like long time horizon guru? Probably not. I think a lot of that comes actually down to, and I 100% agree with you. Uh, a lot of that comes down because people are now coming at the community and we are really early community and a small community, especially the Bitcoin only uh, crowd. And in that community, there are a lot of people that have that low time preference. They are meditating. They are looking out for their food. They have all, all those things going for them. So I think when we have those kind of um, people in that early community, uh, and we have uh, new people coming in, they are influenced more by the community and less yeah. by, by Bitcoin itself. So I think right. a lot of that comes down to we are being in a very early community and not like, oh yeah, we have a different money and all of a sudden our brain functions differently. I yeah, do totally. think that bit sound money does something to society, but not to the extent that a lot of uh, um, people think so. That I think that's a great insight also from you. So a, a great answer uh, uh, fr from you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for, for being on today. Before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people find cars or where can people ask you questions? So uh, people can find me on Twitter my or X. My X handle is at N Newman, N-N-E-U-M-A-N. And then you can also uh, follow Casa. It's at Casa Hodl, C-A-S-A-H-O-D-L. And then our website is Casa.io. You can go on the website, check out our uh, product, check out what we've built, ask our team questions. You know, if you're interested, we can get on a call with you, actually talk you through how CASA works and, and how we can help you get more secure. So please reach out. We're, we're happy to help. And that's, that's what we're building the company for. Thank you so much, Nick, for being on. Also, thank you all everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks, Robert.